I don't know about you, but I am completely and utterly amazed when I see good improv. If you've ever watched uh, like, Whose Line Is It Anyway, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? The ability for people to just quickly create hilarious scenes right there on the spot, it just blows my mind every time. It's amazing. They're incredible. When I was a youth pastor, there was this website uh, that I, I used to get ideas for games, and there was always a section of, of improv games, but it, I learned pretty quickly to avoid uh, the games involving improv because it didn't matter how confident teenagers were, uh, how good they thought they were at improv, um, because they're quick on their feet. You put them on a stage and say go, and suddenly they become timid and meek and a shell of their, their normally gregarious selves. Contrary to popular perception, improvisation is not about being original, clever, witty, or spontaneous. And this is a quote from Sam Wells, a Christian ethics professor. Let me read that quote one more time. Contrary to popular perception, improvisation is not about being original, clever, witty, or spontaneous. If you're like me, your first thought is, if improvisation is not about being original, clever, witty, or spontaneous, then what could it possibly be about? These are the very qualities that I am most impressed with every time I see good improv. If you're like me, your second thought is, how is a Christian ethics professor an authority on improvisation? <laughs> and then maybe your third thought is, wait, why are we talking about improvisation? I thought this was a sermon about Jesus. Um, we're talking about improvisation because Sam Wells, the guy who uh, said this, makes the case that ethical Christian living is improvisation. That, that what you see uh, when an audience throws out a suggestion and a few actors then create this dynamic scene right in front of you, that that is essentially the same thing Christians are doing right now as we follow Jesus. It's as though we are on a stage with suggestions being thrown at us all the time in the form of circumstances, people, events that, that we have no control over. They're just coming at us. And the story that we tell with our lives is ultimately about how we respond to the suggestions coming at us. The reason Wells can say improv is not about being original, clever, witty, or spontaneous is because the best improvisational actors are not making things up on the stage. They are receiving, responding, and elaborating. The audience is the one who is making up the new thing and throwing it at the actors, and the actors receive it and respond to it. But the best improvisational actors always work with the same set of rules, so that no matter what is thrown at them, the rules are always the same. And this is what's crazy for us. Improvisation seems so spontaneous that we don't tend to think about it being a, a thing governed by rules. But Improv is entirely about a set of guiding rules that help tell a good story. Breaking the rules usually ends up in a boring story being played out on the stage. And so this is why witty and clever and self-confident teenagers are not automatically good at improv, because they don't know the rules of it. And these rules are practiced and rehearsed so many times that good improv actors can literally respond to any new suggestion. These rules become a second nature for them. I want to suggest to you that Paul is a model for us in Christian improvisation. Paul knows the rules uh, that make a good Christian story, a life lived with God. And I don't mean rules like do this and don't do that. I mean rules like this is who God is. And this is what God is doing in the world. These rules, these truths have become so second nature for Paul 
that he can receive any new input that comes at him and he can respond in a dynamic and God-honoring way, right? Whether it's, it's friends of his telling him, don't go to Jerusalem because you're gonna suffer there. Or elders in Jerusalem who say, we really think that you should take this vow with your fellow Jews. Or whether it's a word that comes to him while he's in a prison cell, a word from an angel. Or whether it's a word that he gets from a family member who says that there is a plot against his life, or whether it's, it's governors questioning him while he's in chains. It, it doesn't matter. In each of these moments, Paul acts. In each of these cases, he acts decisively based on a set of rules or truths. He receives these new inputs and acts in a way that is faithful to what Paul knows is true about who God is and about what God is doing. I truly have spent the last 15 or so weeks uh, as we've been in Acts together in small group and here and through our daily worship guides trying to figure Paul out. I don't know if you've ever had this struggle uh, as you read about Paul in the New Testament. And I don't think in any way I, I feel like I have arrived at a final word on him, but improvisation seems to make sense as a way of describing what Paul is up to, especially in these final chapters of Acts. See, at the heart of my confusion about Paul is this wild ride he's been taking us on through the last couple weeks in his final journey to Jerusalem and then to Rome. He says... Uh, several chapters earlier that uh, he has committed in his spirit to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. That, that this is something he wants, the text suggests. And then he says that though he doesn't know what awaits him in Jerusalem, he's ready to die. So we at least anticipate that that's a possibility and that Rome might be out of the question. And others come along and they confirm for him that something is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. So he gets to Jerusalem and he, and he seems to do everything possible. As you look at what Paul is doing, he seems to be bringing death upon himself. <laughs> he he uh, goes out in public knowing that there are those who are looking for him. And he gets himself arrested and he almost gets himself killed. In fact, having been beaten so badly that the temple authorities have to carry him out. He could not walk out of the temple courtyard. He then asks, wait, 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 can I speak publicly to this group? And while he's speaking publicly, he provokes this crowd so that they want to kill him even worse than they did before. Then he finds himself in front of this group of religious leaders and he gets them so upset that they want to kill him now. All of this continues until Paul chained in prison, discovers that there is a plot against his life. Now, what does he do? But he, he sends word up the Roman chains of command, up the Roman ranks, in order to preserve his life. This is a strange turn in the story. Wait, 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 what's he doing? And then, while he's still in prison, Paul gets suspicious of... Uh, some stuff that's happening sort of politically around the governor who's questioning him and those who might be behind the scenes. And he's, he's uh, worried, I worried might not be the right word, but concerned that the governor's attempt to move him to another place to face trial could be the, uh, a possibility for ambush. And so once again, Paul acts in a definitive way to avoid death. It's right, you could see the confusion, right? And maybe you, you experience it yourself reading through Acts with us. Who is Paul? What motivates this guy? Why does he say in one moment, I'm willing to die? And then he actively pursues his death until then the next minute he decides, eh, I'm going to start avoiding it. Like what happens to Paul in this story? Well, like a stage of actors acting out a scene, who then received new input from the audience. Paul was living out his scene the best and the most faithfully he could. He knew that he was supposed to go to Jerusalem. He knew that in every place he was going to go, he was going to experience uh, affliction and suffering. And so he expected that from Jerusalem. But then 
God spoke a clear new word. And we heard it in last week's passage in chapter 23, verse 11, where we read, the Lord stood by Paul, Paul's in prison, and he said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me here in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. This is it, right? Immediately after this word from God, Paul begins to act for his own self-preservation. He never does it before this until this moment. He begins now to do things that lead the Roman authorities to send him to Rome. Paul, filled with God's spirit, possessing God's word, improvises his way through a series then of mock trials and defenses. Listen to how Sam Wells summarizes Christian improvisation. He says, the Christian story is a five-act play. Creation, Israel, Jesus, church, and the last things. We find ourselves in act four, and the most important events have already happened. Our role is to be faithful in act four, because God will do the rest in act five. We recognize this structure of the story, right? And we can go to any place in scripture and we can find that it is fulfilling one of these five acts. The Bible opens in act one with God creating all that is seen and unseen. And we discover pretty quickly the role that humanity has played in destroying what God has made and called good. And we don't get very far into the story when when act two is underway and we start to hear God speaking of his radical commitment to this creation. No matter how uh, bad humans are or how good humans are at destroying it, uh, he is unwilling to give up on this project. And so God chooses a people, Israel, from all the people of the earth and God plans to bless all people, and all creation through Israel. And then when the long story of the First Testament exhaustively shows that these people, Israel, are incapable of fulfilling God's call, Act 2 gives way to Act 3, and God sends his own son, his own son to help Israel carry out her mission. When Jesus is raised from the dead, we see our hope. We see in the resurrected Jesus the first fruit of eternal life. We catch our glimpse at the new creation. Act four is then marked by God's gift of his spirit. With the life and the ministry of Jesus as our model and with the guidance and strength of God's spirit, the church made up now of Jew and Gentile, has been called to live as as people of the new creation, announcing its coming arrival. And then throughout the Bible, in bits and glimpses, we're given some sense of what Act 5 will be like. The Bible gives us an idea of where this whole project is moving, of what it is we're waiting for in this Advent season. We see God acting definitively to destroy evil forever. We see God taking all that is broken and bringing healing. All that has died has been raised to new life and all has been made new. And the king of the earth reigns over it all without rival. This is the story the Bible has been telling. It's the story that the Bible is inviting us to join in to and to live out. As Wells puts it, we are participants in Act 4 of this story, called to live faithfully, improvising our way through the act, so that the act has continuity with what came before and what, what will come after. If we learn the story, this five-act story as Paul did, if it becomes our second nature, we ought to be ready for anything. We ought to be ready for any circumstance, any question that comes our way. No question should be too hard. And so as we make our way through the world, as we make our way through our lives, improvising our way 
empowered by the Spirit, Scripture, the Word of God in hand, we, we begin to face real questions. Should I get married? Should I put money away for retirement? How much? Where should I go to college? Should I go to a gay wedding? Should I post this on Facebook? Should we become foster parents? Should we participate in Halloween? How should I vote? Should I vote? What should the church do about ISIS? Should I buy a gun? Should I get a tattoo? Should I go to church? What are the appropriate reasons to miss church? I mean, the questions are unlimited. These are just some of the questions that, that I've heard us asking at various times uh, in the even last couple years. I mean, these questions could keep coming and there are more. We could never stop asking questions about what it means to live in this world at this time. We face an infinite number of, of situations and circumstances and we have to do something, right? And what I'm suggesting to you is that, that improvisation with Paul as our example is how we best live out the answers to these questions. From a desire to be faithful to God. I mean, this is the very heart of it, the very beginning of it. Do you have a desire to be faithful to God? From that place, we learn as much as we can about who God is and what God is up to. And so with that desire to be faithful to God, what do you know about God? What do you know about what God is up to and, and his plan for you and for uh, his creation? From a desire to be faithful to God, we learn as much as we can about uh, who God is and what God is up to, including what he intends for us. And then, based on the unique circumstances that we find ourselves in, we act the best that we can. This is what it means to be faithful. This is the dynamic life of Christian improvisation. Uh, but let me compare that, contrast that to two alternative ways of, of being Christian. And the first would be uh, reading from a script. Uh, Reading from a script is a natural desire, and this is one of the ways that we, we opt for being Christian in the world. The second way that we uh, try to make our way through is thinking that Christian freedom, living by the Spirit, means winging it. I, I'm going to suggest up front that both of these are inadequate to the call to be like Christ and to follow the example of Paul. Because if we think with the first one, those who, who want a script will find one anywhere. Just tell me what to do. Tell me what God wants me to do. Help me figure that out as simply as possible. How can I do what I need to do? And usually there's some fear attached to that so I can get into heaven, so that God will love me, so that right you can fill in the blank. But it's easier. It doesn't require much of me. Just give me something to do. And anytime you hear someone say, the Bible says dot, 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 and then they quote a single verse out of context with no respect for the large five-act story that the Bible is telling, they're reading from a script, right? So if someone tells you, do not get a tattoo because the Bible says, do not mark your body and your body is a temple, you are being given a script to read from. Read it, perform it. Life is that easy. If it says it, you do it. The easiest way to know if someone is living off a script is that they always do the same thing or have the same answer to every, to the, to every moral or ethical question, uh, even when the circumstances are dramatically different. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that there aren't good reasons for not getting a tattoo, but the Bible says it, therefore don't do it, isn't a good Christian reason. When the council in Jerusalem that we read about weeks ago decided that all Gentiles should abstain from sexual immorality, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols, or meat strangled by, uh, 
uh, meat from animals that were strangled or, and don't eat blood. They didn't say this because the Bible said so, right? In fact, there's, there's nothing in the Old Testament that would suggest that these four things alone should stand as universal instruction for Gentiles. The Jerusalem Council, the Jerusalem Council was improvising. Based on what they knew about who God is, based on what they knew about Gentiles, based on what they knew about what God was doing in the world, they thought these would be wise instructions for helping Gentiles flee from idolatry. And so this council abandoned the script of many of the Jews of that day that said all converts, all people who would be God's people must be circumcised and must follow all of the law. And they abandoned this script in order to adapt and live by the Spirit in a new day. But this emphasis on the Spirit also reminds us of the second alternative to Christian improvisation. While some want a script, others want to do what feels right. And they confuse what feels good with what the Spirit of God might be saying. These are the people who feel that getting a tattoo that honors God should be okay, and therefore they're going to do it, regardless of what you say, right? Again, without any appeal to how getting a tattoo fits into living out Act 4 in between Jesus and the new creation. If the script followers use the Bible as their trump card, the freedom followers use the Spirit as theirs, God told me, becomes the way to baptize doing what we want to do. The Spirit is leading, becomes the way that we justify any or all of our behavior. But again, Paul and the Jerusalem Council didn't tell the new Gentile converts that now that you have life in Christ, do whatever feels good. Do what feels natural. No, they knew that what, was, what felt good and was natural to them was idolatry. They knew that these converts needed to have their desires reformed. They knew that they needed to understand deeply that one of the basic rules or truths of Christianity is that there is only one true God. Therefore, any idol worship was going to keep them from worshiping God, from following Jesus. And so they called these Gentiles to, to do some things that would seem unnatural at first, but would ultimately become second nature for them and help them begin in all areas of their life to, to reject and flee from idolatry as a way of faithfully honoring God. We see this most clearly in Paul. Paul is an improvisational master. Chapters 24, 25, and 26 of Acts drop us into the, the, the show, the performance of a lifetime, right? Or more accurately, the life of a faithful Christian. Encounter after encounter after encounter, Paul is confronted by new officials, one governor and then another governor and then this lawyer and then uh, King Agrippa, new circumstances, He's faced by new threats and new opportunities. And without missing a beat, he responds to every single one in ways that, that honor God. It doesn't matter to him if, if it's Felix who's sitting in front of him, this Roman governor with a horrendous reputation. He'll meet him right on his terms. Or Festus, this new governor who knows nothing of him, but who comes in and replaces Felix and is brand new in the region, is trying to figure it out. He'll meet him right where he's at. Or if it's King Agrippa come down, a Jewish ruler who wants to hear Paul, the man himself, he'll talk to him too. Because each of these instances is an opportunity to speak the truth about God to improvise, to be present to the moment, to do what seems faithful and good. In each of these situations, Paul offers a fairly easy defense for himself in each situation, right? He's, he's kind of the easy one to defend here. He's done nothing wrong. Uh, leader after leader keeps saying he's done nothing wrong. Uh, 
And in fact, his, his accusers, the ones who originally resulted in him getting, getting locked up, they're long gone, and so they're not anywhere close. So there is no real evidence against him. And so he quickly dismisses the evidence against himself. But in each instance, based on his audience, Paul then begins to defend the gospel. He begins to take each of his hearers, whoever they are, and point them toward the good news about Jesus. He calls his hearers to understand that the resurrection is at the very heart of our certain hope. He invites his hearers to turn and to receive and to respond to the work that God has done. But trace out each encounter. And Paul tells the gospel with different details. You see how he adapts, how he improvises in each circumstance. He highlights different features of the message as he shares his own story of, of his conversion. He leaves out whole figures who played into his story as he tells it anew. Paul has discovered how to improvise in light of the truth that he knows that he has. Read through each speech that... that that Acts gives us of Paul's, and you will see that, that underlying each speech holds this same five-act story. Creation, the God of our fathers, is, is what he says. Israel, the, the 12 tribes. Jesus, clearly he spends a lot of time here because Paul understands that Jesus has changed everything. The church, what does it mean for us to live in light of what Jesus has done and the last things. Look at everything Paul does and you will see him imitating Jesus, passing on the good news about Jesus, all so that the world might know what God is up to. This is the work of the church in the world between the birth of Jesus and the last things, the return of Jesus. Paul is calling to the church. He's saying, come with me, join with me and point with me to what God is up to so that the world might see the God that we worship, the God that we trust. They might see what God is doing in this world. They might respond and they might give their lives to this God. Everyone responds differently to that good news. For some, this actually isn't very good news, at least not in the way that they tell the story of the world. So when Paul speaks to Felix and to Felix's wife and he starts to talk about righteousness and self-control and judgment, Felix isn't pumped about this. These are not characteristics of Felix's reign as a governor of a large region. Uh, in fact, most people, uh, the, outs, the extra biblical resources we have that speak of Felix and his reign are highly critical of him. He was a man lacking justice. He was a man who was harsh. He was a man who did what he wanted, who took what he wanted. And here Paul speaks to him of righteousness and of self-control, of judgment. If what Paul says is true, Felix realizes this pretty quickly, then uh, he's going to be in trouble. And rather than receive what Paul says as truth, Felix wants to keep telling a different story. And so he sends Paul away, hoping to use Paul for his own advantage, but, but he has no intention of embracing the truth about Paul's words because that would mean far too much for Felix's life, for Felix's rule, for his reign. But here's what I think, in light of Felix, is one of the biggest lessons for us from these, these chapters. Paul is not merely improvising Christian faithfulness. These three chapters specifically, Paul is showing us how to improvise Christian faithfulness in the face of political power, and political realities. Over the last 50 years, evangelical Christians, as a single Christian group in America, have largely lost our ability to improvise Christian faithfulness in the political realm, in the face of politics, in the face of political realities. In the last 50 years, 
uh, we have seen evangelical Christians lay down their responsibility to faithfully discern the times and respond well. And we've laid that down, the, the need to improvise in order to pick up a script, right? A script is always easier. It tells you exactly what to do. The script that evangelicals have generally been working from uh, is not from the Bible, though it often claims to be Bible-based. But for some time now, evangelical Christians have been living out a, a Republican or a conservative script that uses God language, that uses Jesus language. But if we're honest, isn't telling the same story that the Bible's five-act drama is offering us to participate in. It's telling us a different story. That, that script that we've picked up offers us easy answers, easy origin stories. When it says that, that America was founded as a Christian nation, and, and though some scripts pick, uh, vary based on different truths, or based on different groups, the truth is, if we claim that the United States is a special nation in the world, different from other nations, but like Israel, chosen by God. If we claim this, we are betraying the five-act story of Scripture, and we are speaking blasphemy. It is blasphemy because we are suggesting that God has done something for us that the Bible claims God has only done for Israel. And more important, God has already fulfilled the Israel project through Jesus and has moved the story into the next phase or the new act, right? God is no longer in the business of nation building. God is in the business of kingdom building. God is building his kingdom, a kingdom, a kingdom made up of every tribe and every tongue, every people and every nation. This kingdom made up of God's people, of churches all over the world is filled with God's own spirit. This kingdom is called to be a light in the world. And so for anyone to claim that God has given this special kingdom status to their individual nation is to speak blasphemy. It is to speak a different story from a different script. It's important for us to see what Paul does in this story in the face of political powers, right? So if anyone had a desire to see God return Israel to its former self. It was Paul. If anyone longed for God to restore the kingdom of Israel, I mean, it was Paul. But Paul knows the story. God has not moved on from Israel. God has fulfilled Israel's destiny. Now, in the face of Israel's false king, this King Agrippa, Paul doesn't try to influence his politics. Paul doesn't try to get him to change his policies. Paul doesn't say, if you would just lead in god honoring ways, you would bring Israel back to its, its former whatever. Paul knows the story. Israel failed. Israel could never succeed. God knew that. And in God's grace, he sent his son to fulfill Israel's destiny so that they no longer had to attempt to do something they could never do. Jesus did it. Paul is concerned with only one thing, the good news. He would like Agrippa to believe the good news and to respond to it. If as somebody who responds to the good news, he begins to do something with the influence he has, great. But that's it. The church desperately needs for its evangelical brothers and sisters, of whom we are included, as, as well as many more, to reject Republican scripts that are not... Uh, 
rooted in the five-act drama of our scriptures. If it feels like I'm uh, being a, a bit heavy in terms of one political party, it's because for the most part, the church isn't too concerned with uh, going the other direction, right? There aren't too many people who go, being Democrat is what you have to be in order to be a Christian. But the truth is, as a brand new Christian, I was told by somebody, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be, be a Republican. And I think that speaks to the, the false, false script we've been given and we've picked up. See, we see when we read scripture, the script uh, that we've been given as false. When we see that in the face of things like terrorism or of guns or of violence, the script that we've been given says you should be afraid of these things. And so in fear, without blinking, we live out that script as second nature. And so we think that it's the most natural thing to do, that when I'm afraid, when my life is in danger, to preserve myself. And so whether I have to build up armies or arsenals or push enemies as far away as possible to build the biggest walls, it doesn't matter. You have to preserve yourself. But the script that we are being invited to live into says we are not first Americans, we are not first Republicans, we are not first any of those things, but we are the church. And the church has a particular call in the world, and that call is to follow Jesus wherever he would go. It's to understand the heart of God and to understand what God is doing in the world so that as best we are able, we can improvise our way through this. And the beauty of improvisation is that sometimes improvisation fails, right? Sometimes we do our best to sort of be faithful to the scene that we're in, and we just make a bad decision. And, and the beauty of this, as Wells reminds us, is that Act 5 is what God is doing completely. And in some respects, it means we can fail utterly, And God is still able to redeem that. Amen. We have the incredible privilege today of living out Act 4 of God's story of redemption and restoration. If that's where the story is moving, if the story is moving to new creation, the question becomes, in what way are, are our lives caught up in this work of redemption and restoration, whose lives are being redeemed, are having new life, new purpose because of their contact with us and the spirit in us, whose lives are being restored as we walk beside those who are suffering and grieving and who have lost everything. In what way is new creation bursting out into the world because we have sought Jesus and said, I'm going to copy you the best that I can, trusting that your spirit is alive in me. And so, do your thing. Will we learn the story and let it become second nature in us so that we can imp improvise in light of it? Or will we live out other stories?